Preface to a Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Phantom Lover A Fantastic Story by Vernon Lee. To Count Peter Boterlin at Tagancha, Government of Kiev, Russia. My dear Boterlin, do you remember my telling you one afternoon that you sat upon the hearth stool at Florence the story of Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst? You thought it a fantastic tale, you lover of fantastic things, and urged me to write it out at once, although I protested that, in such matters, to write is to exercise, to dispel the charm, and that printer's ink chases away the ghosts that may pleasantly haunt us as efficaciously as gallons of holy water. But, if, as I suspect, you will now put down any charm that story may have possessed to the way in which we had been working ourselves up that firelit evening with all manner of fantastic stuff, if, as I fear, the story of Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst will strike you as stale and unprofitable, the sight of this little book will serve at least to remind you, in the middle of your Russian summer, that there is such a season as winter, such a place as Florence, and such a person as your friend Vernon Lee. A Phantom Lover That sketch up there with the boy's cap? Yes, that's the same woman. I wonder whether you could guess who she was. A singular being, is she not? The most marvelous creature, quite, that I have ever met. A wonderful, elegance, exotic, far-fetched, poignant. An artificial, perverse sort of grace and research in every outline and movement and arrangement of head and neck and hands and fingers. Here are a lot of pencil sketches I made while I was preparing to paint her portrait. Yes, there's nothing but her in the whole sketchbook. Mere scratches, but they may give some idea of her marvelous, fantastic kind of grace. Here she is leaning over the staircase, and here sitting in the swing. Here she is walking quickly out of the room. That's her head. You see, she isn't really handsome. Her forehead is too big, and her nose too short. This gives no idea of her. It was altogether a question of movement. Look at the strange cheeks, hollow and rather flat. Well, when she smiled, she had most marvelous dimples here. There was something exquisite and uncanny about it. Yes, I began the picture, but it was never finished. I did the husband first. I wonder who has his likeness now. Help me to move these pictures away from the wall. Thanks. This is her portrait, a huge wreck. I don't suppose you can make much of it. It is merely blocked in and seems quite mad. You see, my idea was to make her leaning against a wall. There was one hung with yellow that seemed almost brown, so as to bring out the silhouette. It was very singular I should have chosen that particular wall. It does look rather insane in this condition, but I like it. It has something of her. I would frame it and hang it up, only people would ask questions. Yes, you have guessed quite right. It is Mrs. Oak of Oakhurst. I forgot you had relations in that part of the country. Besides, I suppose the newspapers were full of it at the time. You didn't know that it all took place under my eyes? I can scarcely believe now that it did. It all seems so distant, vivid but unreal like a thing of my own invention. It really was much stranger than anyone guessed. 
people could no more understand it than they could understand her i doubt whether any one ever understood alice oak besides myself you mustn't think me unfeeling she was a marvellous weird exquisite creature but one couldn't feel sorry for her i felt much sorrier for the wretched creature of a husband it seemed such an appropriate end for her i fancy she would have liked it could she have known ah i shall never have another chance of painting such a portrait as i wanted she seemed sent me from heaven or the other place you have never heard the story in detail well i don't usually mention it because people are so brutally stupid or sentimental but i'll tell it you let me see it's too dark to paint any more today so i can tell it you now wait i must turn her face to the wall ah she was a marvelous creature end of preface Chapter One of A Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. You remember, three years ago, my telling you I had let myself in for painting a couple of Kentish squireens. I really could not understand what had possessed me to say yes to that man. A friend of mine had brought him one day to my studio, Mr. Oak of Oakhurst, that was the name on his card. He was a very tall, very well-made, very good-looking young man, with a beautiful fair complexion, beautiful fair moustache, and beautifully fitting clothes, absolutely like a hundred other young men you can see any day in the park and absolutely uninteresting from the crown of his head to the tip of his boots mr oak who had been a lieutenant in the guards before his marriage was evidently extremely uncomfortable on finding himself in a studio he felt misgivings about a man who could wear a velvet coat in town, but at the same time he was nervously anxious not to treat me in the very least like a tradesman. He walked round my place, looked at everything with the most scrupulous attention, stammered out a few complimentary phrases, and then, looking at his friend for assistance, tried to come to the point, but failed the point which the friend kindly explained was that mr oak was desirous to know whether my engagements would allow of my painting him and his wife and what my terms would be the poor man blushed perfectly crimson during this explanation as if he had come with the most improper proposal and i noticed the only interesting thing about him a very odd nervous frown between his eyebrows a perfect double gash a thing that usually means something abnormal a mad doctor of my acquaintance calls it the maniac frown when i had answered he suddenly burst out into rather confused explanations his wife mrs oak had seen some of my pictures paintings portraits at the the what do you call it academy she had in short they had made a very great impression upon her Mrs. Oak had a great taste for art. She was, in short, extremely desirous of having her portrait and his painted by me, etc. My wife, he suddenly added, is a remarkable woman. I don't know whether you will think her handsome. She isn't exactly, you know, but she's awfully strange. And Mr. Oak of Oakhurst gave a little sigh and frowned that curious frown, as if so long a speech and so decided an expression of opinion had cost him a great deal it was a rather unfortunate moment in my career a very influential sitter of mine you remember the fat lady with the crimson curtain behind her had come to the conclusion or been persuaded that i had painted her old and vulgar which in fact she was <laughs> 
her whole clique had turned against me the newspapers had taken up the matter and for the moment i was considered as a painter to whose brushes no woman would trust her reputation things were going badly so i snapped but too gladly at mr oak's offer and settled to go down to oakhurst at the end of a fortnight but the door had scarcely closed upon my future sitter when i began to regret my rashness and my disgust at the thought of wasting a whole summer upon the portrait of a totally uninteresting kentish squire and his doubtless equally uninteresting wife grew greater and greater as the time for execution approached i remember so well the frightful temper in which i got into the train for kent and the even more frightful temper in which i got out of it at the little station nearest to oakhurst it was pouring floods i felt a comfortable fury at the thought that my canvases would get nicely wetted before mr oak's coachman had packed them on top of the wagonette it was just what served me right for coming to this confounded place to paint these confounded people we drove off in the steady downpour the roads were a mass of yellow mud the endless flat grazing grounds under the oak trees after having been burned to cinders in a long drought were turned into a hideous brown sop the country seemed intolerably monotonous my spirits sank lower and lower i began to meditate upon the modern gothic country house with the usual amount of morris furniture liberty rugs and moody novels to which i was doubtless being taken my fancy pictured very vividly the five or six little oaks that man certainly must have at least five children the aunts and sisters-in-law and cousins the eternal routine of afternoon tea and lawn tennis above all it pictured mrs oak the bouncing well-informed model housekeeper electioneering charity organizing young woman whom such an individual as mr oak would regard in the light of a remarkable woman and my spirit sank within me and i cursed my avarice in accepting the commission my spiritlessness in not throwing it over while yet there was time we had meanwhile driven into a large park or rather a long succession of grazing grounds dotted about with large oaks under which the sheep were huddled together for shelter from the rain in the distance blurred by the sheets of rain was a line of low hills with a jagged fringe of bluish firs and a solitary windmill it must be a good mile and a half since we had passed a house and there was none to be seen in the distance nothing but the undulation of sere grass sopped brown beneath the huge blackish oak trees and whence arose from all sides a vague disconsolate bleating at last the road made a sudden bend and disclosed what was evidently the home of my sitter it was not what i had expected in a dip in the ground a large red brick house with the rounded gables and high chimney stacks of the time of james i a forlorn vast place set in the midst of the pasture land with no trace of garden before it and only a few large trees indicating the possibility of one to the back no lawn either but on the other side of the sandy dip which suggested a filled-up moat a huge oak short hollow with wreathing blasted black branches upon which only a handful of leaves shook in the rain it was not at all what i had pictured to myself the home of mr oak of oakhurst my host received me in the hall a large place panelled and carved hung round with portraits up to its curious ceiling vaulted and ribbed like the inside of a ship's hull he looked even more blond and pink and white more absolutely mediocre in his tweed suit and also i thought even more good-natured and duller he took me into his study a room hung round with whips and fishing tackle in place of books while my things were being carried upstairs 
It was very damp, and a fire was smoldering. He gave the embers a nervous kick with his foot, and said, as he offered me a cigar, You must excuse my not introducing you at once to Mrs. Oak. My wife, in short, I believe my wife is asleep. Is Mrs. Oak unwell? I asked, a sudden hope flashing across me that I might be off the whole matter. Oh, no, Alice is quite well, at least quite as well as she usually is. My wife, he added after a minute and in a very decided tone, does not enjoy very good health. A nervous constitution. Oh, no, not at all ill. Nothing at all serious, you know. Only nervous, the doctors say. Mustn't be worried or excited, the doctors say. Requires lots of repose, that sort of thing. There was a dead pause. This man depressed me, I knew not why. He had a listless, puzzled look, very much out of keeping with his evident admirable health and strength. I suppose you are a great sportsman? I asked from sheer despair, nodding in the direction of the whips and guns and fishing rods. Oh, no, not now. I was once. I have given up all that, he answered, standing with his back to the fire and staring at the polar bear beneath his feet. I, I have no time for all that now, he added, as if an explanation were due. A married man, you know. Would you like to come up to your rooms? He suddenly interrupted himself. I have had one arranged for you to paint in. My wife said you would prefer a north light. If that one doesn't suit, you can have your choice of any other. I followed him out of the study, through the vast entrance hall. In less than a minute I was no longer thinking of Mr. and Mrs. Oak and the boredom of doing their likeness. I was simply overcome by the beauty of this house, which I had pictured modern and philistine. It was, without exception, the most perfect example of an old English manor house that I had ever seen, the most magnificent intrinsically and the most admirably preserved. Out of the huge hall, with its immense fireplace of delicately carved and inlaid gray and black stone, and its rows of family portraits, reaching from the wainscoting to the oaken ceiling, vaulted and ribbed like a ship's hull, opened the wide, flat-stepped staircase, the parapet surmounted at intervals by heraldic monsters, the wall covered with oak carvings of coats of arms, leafage, and little mythological scenes, painted a faded red and blue, and picked out with tarnished gold which harmonized with the tarnished blue and gold of the stamped leather that reached to the oak cornice, again delicately tinted and gilded. The beautifully damascened suits of court armor looked, without being at all rusty, as if no modern hand had ever touched them. The very rugs underfoot were of sixteenth-century Persian make. The only things of today were the big bunches of flowers and ferns arranged in majolica dishes upon the landings. Everything was perfectly silent. Only from below came the chimes, silvery like an Italian palace fountain, of an old-fashioned clock. It seemed to me that I was being led through the palace of the sleeping beauty. What a magnificent house! I exclaimed, as I followed my host through a long corridor, also hung with leather, wainscoted with carvings and furnished with big wedding coffers, and chairs that looked as if they came out of some Van Dyck portrait. In my mind was the strong impression that all this was natural, spontaneous, that it had about it nothing of the picturesqueness which swell studios have taught to rich and aesthetic houses. Mr. Oak misunderstood me. It is a nice old place, he said, but it's too large for us. You see, my wife's health does not allow for our having many guests, and there are no children. I thought I noticed a vague complaint in his voice, and he evidently was afraid there might have seemed something of the kind, for he 
added immediately i don't care for children one jackstraw you know myself can't understand how any one can for my part if ever a man went out of his way to tell a lie i said to myself mr oak of oakhurst was doing so at the present moment when he had left me in one of the two enormous rooms that were allotted to me i threw myself into an armchair and tried to focus the extraordinary imaginative impression which this house had given me i am very susceptible to such impressions and besides the sort of spasm of imaginative interest sometimes given to me by certain rare and eccentric personalities i know nothing more subduing than the charm quieter and less analytic of any sort of complete and out of the common run sort of house to sit in a room like the one i was sitting in with the figures of the tapestry glimmering gray and lilac and purple in the twilight the great bed columned and curtained looming in the middle and the embers reddening beneath the overhanging mantelpiece of inlaid italian stonework a vague scent of rose leaves and spices put into the china bowls by the hands of ladies long since dead filling the room while the clock downstairs sent up every now and then its faint silvery tune of forgotten days to do this is a special kind of voluptuousness peculiar and complex and indescribable like the half drunkenness of opium or hashish and which to be conveyed to others in any sense as i feel it would require a genius subtle and heady like that of baudelaire after i had dressed for dinner i resumed my place in the armchair and resumed also my reverie letting all these impressions of the past which seemed faded like the figures of the heiress but still warm like the embers in the fireplace still sweet and subtle like the perfume of the dead rose leaves and broken spices in the china bowls permeate me and go to my head of oak and oak's wife i did not think i seemed quite alone isolated from the world separated from it in this exotic enjoyment gradually the embers grew paler the figures in the tapestry more shadowy the columned and curtained bed loomed out vaguer the room seemed to fill with grayness and my eyes wandered to the mullioned bow window beyond whose panes between whose heavy stonework stretched a grayish-brown expanse of sere and sodden park grass dotted with big oaks while far off behind a jagged fringe of dark scotch firs the wet sky was suffused with the blood-red of the sunset between the falling of the raindrops from the ivy outside there came fainter or sharper the recurring bleating of the lambs separated from their mothers a forlorn quavering eerie little cry i started up at a sudden rap at my door haven't you heard the gong for dinner asked mr oak's voice i had completely forgotten his existence end of chapter one chapter two of a phantom lover by vernon lee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org i feel that i cannot possibly reconstruct my earliest impressions of mrs oak my recollection of them would be entirely colored by my subsequent knowledge of her whence i conclude that i could not at first have experienced the strange interest and admiration which that extraordinary woman very soon excited in me interest and admiration be it well understood of a very unusual kind as she was herself a very unusual kind of woman and i if you choose am a rather unusual kind of man but i can explain that better anon this much is certain that i must have been immeasurably surprised at finding my hostess and future sitter so completely unlike everything i had anticipated or no 
Now I come to think of it, I scarcely felt surprised at all. Or if I did, that shock of surprise could have lasted but an infinitesimal part of a minute. The fact is, that having once seen Alice Oak in the reality, it was quite impossible to remember that one could have fancied her at all different. There was something so complete, so completely unlike everyone else, in her personality, that she seemed always to have been present in one's consciousness, although present, perhaps, as an enigma. Let me try and give you some notion of her. Not that first impression, whatever it may have been, but the absolute reality of her as I gradually learned to see it. To begin with, I must repeat and reiterate over and over again that she was, beyond all comparison, the most graceful and exquisite woman I have ever seen, but with a grace and an exquisiteness that had nothing to do with any preconceived notion or previous experience of what goes by these names. Grace and exquisiteness recognized at once as perfect, but which were seen in her for the first time and probably, I do believe, for the last time. It is conceivable, is it not, that once in a thousand years there may arise a combination of lines, a system of movements, an outline, a gesture, which is new, unprecedented, and yet hits off exactly our desires for beauty and rareness? She was very tall, and I suppose people would have called her thin. I don't know, for I never thought about her as a body, bones, flesh, that sort of thing, but merely as a wonderful series of lines, and a wonderful strangeness of personality. Tall and slender, certainly, and with not one item of what makes up our notion of a well-built woman. She was as straight, I mean she had as little of what people call figure, as a bamboo. Her shoulders were a trifle high, and she had a decided stoop. Her arms and her shoulders she never once wore uncovered. But this bamboo figure of hers had a suppleness and a stateliness, a play of outline with every step she took, that I can't compare to anything else. There was in it something of the peacock, and also something of the stag. But above all, it was her own. I wish I could describe her. I wish, alas. I wish, I wish. I have wished a hundred thousand times I could paint her, as I see her now if I shut my eyes, even if it were only a silhouette. There, I see her so plainly, walking slowly up and down a room, the slight highness of her shoulders just completing the exquisite arrangement of lines made by the straight, supple back, the long, exquisite neck, the head with the hair cropped in short, pale curls, always drooping a little, except when she would suddenly throw it back and smile, not at me, nor at any one, nor at anything that had been said, but as if she alone had suddenly seen or heard something, with a strange dimple in her thin, pale cheeks, and the strange whiteness of her full, wide-opened eyes, the moment when she had something of the stag in her movement. But where is the use of talking about her? I don't believe, you know, that even the greatest painter can show what is the real beauty of a very beautiful woman in the ordinary sense. Titians and Tintoretto's women must have been miles handsomer than they have made them. Something, and that the very essence, always escapes, perhaps because real beauty is as much a thing in time, a thing like music, a succession, a series, as in space. Mind you, I am speaking of a woman beautiful in the conventional sense. Imagine, then, how much more so in the case of a woman like Alice Oak. And if the pencil and brush, imitating each line and tint, can't succeed, how is it possible to give even the vaguest notion with mere wretched words, words possessing only a wretched abstract meaning and impotent conventional association? To make a long story short, 
mrs oak of oakhurst was in my opinion to the highest degree exquisite and strange an exotic creature whose charm you can no more describe than you could bring home the perfume of some newly discovered tropical flower by comparing it with the scent of a cabbage rose or a lily that first dinner was gloomy enough mr oak oak of oakhurst as the people down there called him was horribly shy consumed with a fear of making a fool of himself before me and his wife i then thought but that sort of shyness did not wear off and i soon discovered that although it was doubtless increased by the presence of a total stranger it was inspired in oak not by me but by his wife he would look every now and then as if he were going to make a remark and then evidently restrain himself and remain silent it was very curious to see this huge handsome manly young fellow who ought to have had any amount of success with women suddenly stammer and grow crimson in the presence of his own wife nor was it the consciousness of stupidity for when you got him alone oak although always slow and timid had a certain amount of ideas and very defined political and social views and a certain childlike earnestness and desire to attain certainty and truth which was rather touching on the other hand oak's singular shyness was not so far as i could see the result of any kind of bullying on his wife's part you can always detect if you have any observation the husband or the wife who is accustomed to be snubbed to be corrected by his or her better half there is a consciousness in both parties a habit of watching and fault-finding of being watched and found fault with this was clearly not the case at oakhurst mrs oak evidently did not trouble herself about her husband in the very least he might say or do any amount of silly things without rebuke or even notice and he might have done so had he chosen ever since his wedding day you felt that at once mrs oak simply passed over his existence i cannot say she paid much attention to any one's even to mine at first i thought it an affectation on her part for there was something far-fetched in her whole appearance something suggesting study which might lead one to tax her with affectation at first she was dressed in a strange way not according to any established aesthetic eccentricity but individually strangely as if in the clothes of an ancestress of the seventeenth century while at first i thought it a kind of pose on her part the mixture of extreme graciousness and utter indifference which she manifested towards me she always seemed to be thinking of something else and although she talked quite sufficiently and with every sign of superior intelligence she left the impression of having been as taciturn as her husband in the beginning in the first few days of my stay at oakhurst i imagined that mrs oak was a highly superior sort of flirt and that her absent manner her look while speaking to you into an invisible distance her curious irrelevant smile were so many means of attracting and baffling adoration i mistook it for the somewhat similar manners of certain foreign women it is beyond english ones which mean to those who can understand pay court to me but i soon found i was mistaken mrs oak had not the faintest desire that i should pay court to her indeed she did not honour me with sufficient thought for that and i on my part began to be too much interested in her from another point of view to dream of such a thing i became aware not merely that i had before me the most marvellously rare and exquisite and baffling subject for a portrait but also one of the most peculiar and enigmatic of characters now that i look back upon it i am tempted to think that the psychological peculiarity of that woman might be summed up in an exorbitant and absorbing interest in herself a narcissus attitude curiously complicated with a fantastic imagination a sort of morbid day-dreaming all turned inwards and with no outer characteristic save a certain restlessness a perverse desire to surprise and shock to surprise and shock more particularly her husband and thus be revenged for the intense boredom which his presence evidently inflicted upon her i got to understand this much little by little 
yet I did not seem to have really penetrated the something mysterious about Mrs. Oak. There was a waywardness, a strangeness, which I felt but could not explain, a something as difficult to define as the peculiarity of her outward appearance, and perhaps very closely connected therewith. I became interested in Mrs. Oak as if I had been in love with her, and I was not in the least in love. I neither dreaded parting from her nor felt any pleasure in her presence. I had not the smallest wish to please or gain her notice. But I had her on the brain. I pursued her, her physical image, her psychological explanation, with a kind of passion which filled my days and prevented my ever feeling dull. The Oaks lived a remarkably solitary life. There were but few neighbors, of whom they saw but little, and they rarely had a guest in the house. Oak himself seemed every now and then seized with a sense of responsibility towards me. He would remark vaguely, during our walks and after-dinner chats, that I must find life at Oakhurst horribly dull. His wife's health had accustomed him to solitude, and then, also, his wife thought the neighbors a bore. He never questioned his wife's judgment in these matters. He merely stated the case as if resignation were quite simple and inevitable. Yet it seemed to me sometimes that this monotonous life of solitude by the side of a woman who took no more heed of him than of a table or chair was producing a vague depression and irritation in this young man, so evidently cut out for a cheerful, commonplace life. I often wondered how he could endure it at all, not having as I had the interest of a strange psychological riddle to solve and of a great portrait to paint. He was, I found, extremely good, the type of the perfectly conscientious young Englishman, the sort of man who ought to have been the Christian soldier kind of thing, devout, pure-minded, brave incapable of any baseness, a little intellectually dense and puzzled by all manner of moral scruples. The condition of his tenants and his political party, he was a regular Kentish Tory, lay heavy on his mind. He spent hours, every day, in his study, doing the work of a land agent and a political whip, reading piles of reports and newspapers and agricultural treatises, and emerging for lunch with piles of letters in his hand, and that odd, puzzled look on his good, healthy face, that deep gash between his eyebrows which my friend, the mad doctor, calls the maniac frown. It was with this expression of face that I should have liked to paint him, but I felt that he would not have liked it, that it was more fair to him to represent him in his more wholesome pink-and-white blonde conventionality. I was, perhaps, rather unconscientious about the likeness of Mr. Oak. I felt satisfied to paint it no matter how, I mean as regards character, for my whole mind was swallowed up in thinking how I should paint Mrs. Oak, how I could best transport onto canvas that singular and enigmatic personality. I began with her husband, and told her frankly that I must have much longer to study her. Mr. Oak couldn't understand why it should be necessary to make a hundred and one pencil sketches of his wife before even determining in what attitude to paint her. But I think he was rather pleased to have an opportunity of keeping me at Oakhurst. My presence evidently broke the monotony of his life. Mrs. Oak seemed perfectly indifferent to my staying, as she was perfectly indifferent to my presence. Without being rude, I never saw a woman pay so little attention to a guest. She would talk with me sometimes by the hour, or rather let me talk to her, but she never seemed to be listening. She would lie back in a big seventeenth-century armchair while I played the piano, with that strange smile every now and then in her thin cheeks, that strange whiteness in her eyes, but it seemed a matter of indifference whether my music stopped or went on. In my portrait of her husband, she did not take or pretend to take the very faintest interest, but that was nothing to me. I didn't want Mrs. Oak to think me interesting. I merely wished to go on studying her. 
the first time that mrs oak seemed to become at all aware of my presence as distinguished from that of the chairs and tables the dogs that lay in the porch or the clergyman or lawyer or stray neighbor who was occasionally asked to dinner was one day i might have been there a week when i chanced to remark to her upon the very singular resemblance that existed between herself and the portrait of a lady that hung in the hall with the ceiling like a ship's hull the picture in question was a full length neither very good nor very bad probably done by some stray italian of the early seventeenth century it hung in a rather dark corner facing the portrait evidently painted to be its companion of a dark man with a somewhat unpleasant expression of resolution and efficiency in a black von Dyck dress the two were evidently man and wife and in the corner of the woman's portrait were the words alice oak daughter of virgil pomfret esq and wife to nicholas oak of oakhurst and the date sixteen twenty six nicholas oak being the name painted in the corner of the small portrait the lady was really wonderfully like the present mrs oak at least so far as an indifferently painted portrait of the early days of charles i can be like a living woman of the nineteenth century there were the same strange lines of figure and face the same dimples in the thin cheeks the same wide-opened eyes the same vague eccentricity of expression not destroyed even by the feeble painting and conventional manner of the time one could fancy that this woman had the same walk the same beautiful line of nape of the neck and stooping head as her descendant for i found that mr and mrs oak who were first cousins were both descended from that nicholas oak and that alice daughter of virgil pomfret but the resemblance was heightened by the fact that as i soon saw the present mrs oak distinctly made herself up to look like her ancestress dressing in garments that had a seventeenth-century look nay that were sometimes absolutely copied from this portrait you think i am like her answered mrs oak dreamily to my remark and her eyes wandered off to that unseen something and the faint smile dimpled her thin cheeks you are like her and you know it i may even say you wish to be like her mrs oak i answered laughing perhaps i do and she looked in the direction of her husband i noticed that he had an expression of distinct annoyance besides that frown of his isn't it true that mrs oak tries to look like that portrait i asked with a perverse curiosity oh fudge he exclaimed rising from his chair and walking nervously to the window it's all nonsense mere nonsense i wish you wouldn't alice wouldn't what asked mrs oak with a sort of contemptuous indifference if i am like that alice oak why i am and i am very pleased any one should think so she and her husband are just about the only two members of our family our most flat stale and unprofitable family that ever were in the least degree interesting oak grew crimson and frowned as if in pain i don't see why you should abuse our family alice he said thank god our people have always been honorable and upright men and women excepting always nicholas oak and alice his wife daughter of virgil pomfret esq she answered laughing as he strode out into the park how childish he is she exclaimed when we were alone he really minds really feels disgraced by what our ancestors did two centuries and a half ago i do believe william would have those two portraits taken down and burned if he weren't afraid of me and ashamed of the neighbors and as it is these two people really are the only two members of our family that ever were in the least interesting i will tell you this story some day as it was the story was told to me by oak himself the next day as we were taking our morning walk he suddenly broke a long silence laying about him all the time at the sear grasses with the hooked stick that he carried like the conscientious kentishman he was for the purpose of cutting down his and other folks thistles i fear you must have thought me very ill-mannered towards my wife yesterday he said shyly 
and indeed I know I was. Oak was one of those chivalrous beings to whom every woman, every wife, and his own most of all, appeared in the light of something holy. But, but, I have a prejudice which my wife does not enter into, about raking up ugly things in one's own family. I suppose Alice thinks that it is so long ago that it has really got no connection with us. She thinks of it merely as a picturesque story. I dare say many people feel like that. In short, I am sure they do. Otherwise, there wouldn't be such lots of discreditable family traditions afloat. But I feel as if it were all one, whether it were long ago or not. When it's a question of one's own people, I would rather have it forgotten. I can't understand how people can talk about murders in their families, and ghosts, and so forth. "'Have you any ghosts at Oakhurst, by the way?' I asked. The place seemed as if it required some to complete it. "'I hope not,' answered Oak gravely. His gravity made me smile. "'Why would you dislike it if there were?' I asked. If there are such things as ghosts, he replied, I don't think they should be taken lightly. God would not permit them to be, except as a warning or a punishment. We walked on some time in silence, I wondering at the strange type of this commonplace young man, and half wishing I could put something into my portrait that should be the equivalent of this curious, unimaginative earnestness. Then Oak told me the story of those two pictures, told it me about as badly and hesitatingly as was possible for mortal man. He and his wife were, as I have said, cousins, and therefore descended from the same old Kentish stock. The Oaks of Oakhurst could trace back to Norman, almost to Saxon times, far longer than any of the titled or better known families of the neighborhood. I saw that William Oak, in his heart, thoroughly looked down upon all his neighbors. We have never done anything particular, or been anything particular, never held any office, he said, but we have always been here, and apparently always done our duty. An ancestor of ours was killed in the Scotch Wars, another at Agincourt, mere honest captains. Well, early in the seventeenth century the family had dwindled to a single member, Nicholas Oak, the same who had rebuilt Oakhurst in its present shape. This Nicholas appears to have been somewhat different from the usual run of the family. He had in his youth sought adventures in America, and seems, generally speaking, to have been less of a non-entity than his ancestors. He married, when no longer very young, Alice, daughter of Virgil Pomfret, a beautiful young heiress from a neighboring county. It was the first time an oak married a Pomfret, my host informed me, and the last time. The Pomfrets were quite different sorts of people, restless, self-seeking. One of them had been a favorite of Henry the Eighth. It was clear that William Oak had no feeling of having any pomfret blood in his veins. He spoke of these people with an evident family dislike, the dislike of an oak, one of the old, honorable, modest stock which had quietly done its duty for a family of fortune-seekers and court minions. Well, there had come to live near Oakhurst in a little house recently inherited from an uncle, a certain Christopher Lovelock a young gallant and poet, who was in momentary disgrace at court for some love affair. This Lovelock had struck up a great friendship with his neighbors of Oakhurst, too great a friendship apparently with the wife, either for her husband's taste or her own. Anyhow, one evening as he was riding home alone, Lovelock had been attacked and murdered ostensibly by highwaymen, but, as was afterwards rumored, by Nicholas Oak, accompanied by his wife dressed as a groom. No legal evidence had been got, but the tradition had remained. They used to tell us when we were children, said my host in a hoarse voice, and to frighten my cousin, I mean my wife, and me with stories about Lovelock. It is merely a tradition which I hope may die out, as I sincerely pray to heaven that it may be false. Alice, 
Mrs. Oak, you see, he went on after some time, doesn't feel about it as I do. Perhaps I am morbid, but I do dislike having the old story raked up. And we said no more on the subject. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of A Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From that moment, I began to assume a certain interest in the eyes of Mrs. Oak, or rather, I began to perceive that I had a means of securing her attention. Perhaps it was wrong of me to do so, and I have often reproached myself very seriously later on, but after all, how was I to guess that I was making mischief merely by chiming in for the sake of the portrait I had undertaken, and of a very harmless psychological mania with what was merely the fad, the little romantic affectation or eccentricity of a scatterbrained and eccentric young woman. How in the world should I have dreamed that I was handling explosive substances? A man is surely not responsible if the people with whom he is forced to deal, and whom he deals with as with all the rest of the world, are quite different from all other human creatures. So, if indeed I did at all conduce to mischief, I really cannot blame myself. I had met in Mrs. Oak an almost unique subject for a portrait painter of any particular sort, and a most singular, bizarre personality. I could not possibly do my subject justice so long as I was kept at a distance, prevented from studying the real character of the woman. I required to put her into play and I ask you whether any more innocent way of doing so could be found than talking to a woman and letting her talk about an absurd fancy she had for a couple of ancestors of hers of the time of Charles I, and a poet whom they had murdered. Particularly, as I studiously respected the prejudices of my host and refrained from mentioning the matter, and tried to restrain Mrs. Oak from doing so in the presence of William Oak himself. I had certainly guessed correctly. To resemble the Alice Oak of the year 1626 was the caprice, the mania, the pose, the whatever you may call it, of the Alice Oak of 1880 and to perceive this resemblance was the sure way of gaining her good graces. It was the most extraordinary craze, of all the extraordinary crazes of childless and idle women that I have ever met, but it was more than that, it was admirably characteristic. It finished off the strange figure of Mrs. Oak as I saw it in my imagination, this bizarre creature of enigmatic, far-fetched exquisiteness, that she should have no interest in the present, but only an eccentric passion in the past. It seemed to give the meaning to the absent look in her eyes, to her irrelevant and far-off smile. It was like the words to a weird piece of gypsy music, this that she, who was so different, so distant from all women of her own time should try and identify herself with a woman of the past that she should have a kind of flirtation but of this anon i told mrs oak that i had learned from her husband the outline of the tragedy or mystery whichever it was of alice oak daughter of virgil pomfret and the poet christopher lovelock that look of vague contempt of a desire to shock, which I had noticed before, came into her beautiful, pale, diaphanous face. I suppose my husband was very shocked at the whole matter, she said, told it you with as little detail as possible, and assured you very solemnly that he hoped the whole story might be a mere dreadful calumny. Poor Willie, 
i remember already when we were children and i used to come with my mother to spend christmas at oakhurst and my cousin was down here for his holidays how i used to horrify him by insisting upon dressing up in shawls and waterproofs and playing the story of the wicked mrs oak and he always piously refused to do the part of nicholas when i wanted to have the scene on coates common i didn't know then that i was like the original alice oak i found it out only after our marriage you really think that i am she certainly was particularly at that moment as she stood in a white van dyke dress with the green of the park land rising up behind her and the low sun catching her short locks and surrounding her head her exquisitely bowed head with a pale yellow halo but i confess i thought the original alice oak siren and murderous though she might be very uninteresting compared with this wayward and exquisite creature whom i had rashly promised myself to send down to posterity in all her unlikely wayward exquisiteness one morning while mr oak was dispatching his saturday heap of conservative manifestos and rural decisions he was justice of the peace in a most literal sense penetrating into cottages and huts defending the weak and admonishing the ill-conducted one morning while i was making one of my many pencil sketches alas they are all that remain to me now of my future sitter mrs oak gave me her version of the story of alice oak and christopher lovelock do you suppose there was anything between them i asked that she was ever in love with him how do you explain the part which tradition ascribes to her in the supposed murder one has heard of women and their lovers who have killed a husband but a woman who combines with her husband to kill her lover or at least the man who is in love with her that is surely very singular i was absorbed in my drawing and really thinking very little of what i was saying i don't know she answered pensively with that distant look in her eyes alice oak was very proud i am sure she may have loved the poet very much and yet been indignant with him hated having to love him she may have felt that she had a right to rid herself of him and to call upon her husband to help her to do so good heavens what a fearful idea i exclaimed half laughing don't you think after all that mr oak may be right in saying that it is easier and more comfortable to take the whole story as a pure invention i cannot take it as an invention answered mrs oak contemptuously because i happen to know that it is true indeed i answered working away at my sketch and enjoying putting this strange creature as i said to myself through her paces how is that how does one know that anything is true in this world she replied evasively because one does because one feels it to be true i suppose and with that far-off look in her light eyes she relapsed into silence have you ever read any of lovelock's poetry she asked me suddenly the next day lovelock i answered for i had forgotten the name lovelock who but i stopped remembering the prejudices of my host who was seated next to me at the table lovelock who was killed by mr oakes and my ancestors and she looked full at her husband as if in perverse enjoyment of the evident annoyance which it caused him alice he entreated in a low voice his whole face crimson for mercy's sake don't talk about such things before the servants mrs oak burst into a high light rather hysterical laugh the laugh of a naughty child the servants gracious heavens do you suppose they haven't heard the story why it's as well known as oakhurst itself in the neighbourhood don't they believe that lovelock has been seen about the house haven't they all heard his footsteps in the big corridor haven't they my dear willie noticed a thousand times that you never will stay a minute alone in the yellow drawing-room that you run out of it like a child if i happen to leave you there for a minute true how was it i had not noticed that or rather that i only now remembered having noticed it the yellow drawing-room was one of the most charming rooms in the house a large bright room 
hung with yellow damask and panelled with carvings that opened straight out on to the lawn far superior to the room in which we habitually sat which was comparatively gloomy this time mr oak struck me as really too childish i felt an intense desire to badger him the yellow drawing-room i exclaimed does this interesting literary character haunt the yellow drawing-room do tell me about it what happened there mr oak made a painful effort to laugh nothing ever happened there so far as i know he said and rose from the table really i asked incredulously nothing did happen there answered mrs oak slowly playing mechanically with a fork and picking out the pattern of the tablecloth that is just the extraordinary circumstance that so far as any one knows nothing ever did happen there and yet that room has an evil reputation no member of our family they say can bear to sit there alone for more than a minute you see william evidently cannot have you ever seen or heard anything strange there i asked my host he shook his head nothing he answered curtly and lit his cigar i presume you have not i asked half laughing of mrs oak since you don't mind sitting in that room for hours alone how do you explain this uncanny reputation since nothing ever happened there perhaps something is destined to happen there in the future she answered in her absent voice and then she suddenly added suppose you paint my portrait in that room mr oak suddenly turned round he was very white and looked as if he were going to say something but desisted why do you worry mr oak like that i asked when he had gone into his smoking-room with his usual bundle of papers it is very cruel of you mrs oak you ought to have more consideration for people who believe in such things although you may not be able to put yourself in their frame of mind who tells you that i don't believe in such things as you call them she answered abruptly come she said after a minute i want to show you why i believe in christopher lovelock come with me into the yellow room end of chapter three chapter four of a phantom lover by vernon lee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What Mrs. Oak showed me in the yellow room was a large bundle of papers, some printed and some manuscript, but all of them brown with age, which she took out of an old Italian ebony inlaid cabinet. It took her some time to get them as a complicated arrangement of double locks and false drawers had to be put in play and while she was doing so i looked round the room in which i had been only three or four times before it was certainly the most beautiful room in this beautiful house and as it seemed to me now the most strange it was long and low with something that made you think of the cabin of a ship with a great mullioned window that let in as it were a perspective of the brownish-green parkland dotted with oaks and sloping upwards to the distant line of bluish firs against the horizon the walls were hung with flowered damask whose yellow faded to brown united with the reddish colour of the carved wainscoting and the carved oaken beams for the rest it reminded me more of an italian room than an english one the furniture was tuscan of the early seventeenth century inlaid and carved there were a couple of faded allegorical pictures by some bolognese master on the walls and in a corner among a stack of dwarf orange trees a little italian harpsichord of exquisite curve and slenderness with flowers and landscapes painted upon its cover in a recess was a shelf of old books mainly english and italian poets of the elizabethan time and close by it placed upon a carved wedding chest a large and beautiful melon-shaped lute the panes of mullioned window were open and yet the air seemed heavy with an indescribable heady perfume not that of any growing flower 
but like that of old stuff that had lain for years among spices. "'It is a beautiful room,' I exclaimed. "'I should awfully like to paint you in it.' But I had scarcely spoken the words when I felt I had done wrong. This woman's husband could not bear the room, and it seemed to me vaguely as if he were right in detesting it. Mrs. Oak took no notice of my exclamation, but beckoned me to the table where she was standing sorting the papers. Look, she said, these are all poems by Christopher Lovelock, and, touching the yellow papers with delicate and reverent fingers, she commenced reading some of them aloud in a slow, half-audible voice. They were songs in the style of those of Herrick, Waller, and Drayton, complaining for the most part of the cruelty of a lady called Dryope, in whose name was evidently concealed a reference to that of the mistress of Oakhurst. The songs were graceful, and not without a certain faded passion, but I was thinking not of them, but of the woman who was reading them to me. Mrs. Oak was standing with the brownish-yellow wall on a background to her white brocade dress, which, in its stiff seventeenth-century make, seemed but to bring out more clearly the slightness, the exquisite suppleness of her tall figure. She held the papers in one hand and leaned the other, as if for support, on the inlaid cabinet by her side. Her voice, which was delicate, shadowy, like her person, had a curious throbbing cadence, as if she were reading the words of a melody and restraining herself with difficulty from singing it, and as she read, her long, slender throat throbbed slightly, and a faint redness came into her thin face. She evidently knew the verses by heart, and her eyes were mostly fixed with that distant smile in them, with which harmonized a constant tremulous little smile in her lips. "'That is how I would wish to paint her,' I exclaimed within myself, and scarcely noticed what struck me on thinking over the scene that this strange being read these verses as one might fancy a woman would read love verses addressed to herself. "'Those are all written for Alice Oak, Alice, the daughter of Virgil Pomfret,' she said slowly, folding up the papers. "'I found them at the bottom of this cabinet. Can you doubt of the reality of Christopher Lovelock now?' The question was an illogical one, for to doubt of the existence of Christopher Lovelock was one thing, and to doubt of the mode of his death was another, but somehow I did feel convinced. Look, she said, when she had replaced the poems, I will show you something else. Among the flowers that stood on the upper story of her writing table, for I found that Mrs. Oak had a writing table in the yellow room, stood, as on an altar, a small, black, carved frame with a silk curtain drawn over it, the sort of thing behind which you would have expected to find a head of Christ or of the Virgin Mary. She drew the curtain and displayed a large-sized miniature representing a young man with auburn curls and a peaked auburn beard, dressed in black but with lace about his neck and large pear-shaped pearls in his ears, a wistful, melancholy face. Mrs. Oak took the miniature religiously off its stand, and showed me, written in faded characters upon the back, the name Christopher Lovelock, and the date, 1626. "'I found this in the secret drawer of that cabinet, together with the heap of poems,' she said, taking the miniature out of my hand. I was silent for a minute. "'Does—does does Mr. Oak know that you have got it here?' I asked and then wondered what in the world had impelled me to put such a question. Mrs. Oak smiled that smile of contemptuous indifference. I have never hidden it from any one. If my husband disliked my having it, he might have taken it away, I suppose. It belongs to him, since it was found in his house. I did not answer, but walked mechanically towards the door. There was something heady and oppressive in this beautiful room, something i thought almost repulsive in this exquisite woman she seemed to me suddenly perverse and dangerous i scarcely knew why but i neglected mrs oak that afternoon i went to mr oak's study and sat opposite to him smoking while he was engrossed in his accounts his reports and electioneering papers <laughs> 
on the table above the heap of paper-bound volumes and pigeonholed documents was as sole ornament of his den a little photograph of his wife done some years before i don't know why but as i sat and watched him with his florid honest manly beauty working away conscientiously with that little perplexed frown of his i felt intensely sorry for this man but this feeling did not last there was no help for it oak was not as interesting as mrs oak and it required too great an effort to pump up sympathy for this normal excellent exemplary young squire in the presence of so wonderful a creature as his wife so i let myself go to the habit of allowing mrs oak daily to talk over her strange craze or rather of drawing her out about it i confess that i derived a morbid and exquisite pleasure in doing so it was so characteristic in her so appropriate to the house it completed her personality so perfectly and made it so much easier to conceive a way of painting her i made up my mind little by little while working at william oak's portrait he proved a less easy subject than i had anticipated and despite his conscientious efforts was a nervous uncomfortable sitter silent and brooding i made up my mind that i would paint mrs oak standing by the cabinet in the yellow room in the white von dyke dress copied from the portrait of her ancestress mr oak might resent it mrs oak might even resent it they might refuse to take the picture to pay for it to allow me to exhibit they might force me to run my umbrella through the picture no matter that picture should be painted if merely for the sake of having painted it for i felt it was the only thing i could do and that it would be far away my best work i told neither of my resolution but prepared sketch after sketch of mrs oak while continuing to paint her husband mrs oak was a silent person more silent even than her husband for she did not feel bound as he did to attempt to entertain a guest or to show any interest in him she seemed to spend her life a curious inactive half invalidish life broken by sudden fits of childish cheerfulness in an eternal daydream strolling about the house and grounds arranging the quantities of flowers that always filled all the rooms beginning to read and then throwing aside novels and books of poetry of which she always had a large number and i believe lying for hours doing nothing on a couch in that yellow drawing-room which with her sole exception no member of the oak family had ever been known to stay in alone little by little i began to suspect and to verify another eccentricity of this eccentric being and to understand why there were stringent orders never to disturb her in that yellow room it had been a habit at oakhurst as at one or two other english manor houses to keep a certain amount of clothes of each generation more particularly wedding dresses a certain carved oaken press of which mr oak once displayed the contents to me was a perfect museum of costumes male and female from the early years of the seventeenth to the end of the eighteenth century a thing to take away the breath of a bric-a-brac collector an antiquary or a genre painter mr oak was none of these and therefore took but little interest in the collection save in so far as it interested his family feeling still he seemed well acquainted with the contents of that press he was turning over the clothes for my benefit when suddenly i noticed that he frowned i know not what impelled me to say by the way have you any dresses of that mrs oak whom your wife resembled so much have you got that particular white dress she was painted in perhaps oak of oakhurst flushed very red we have it he answered hesitatingly but it isn't here at present i can't find it i suppose he blurted out with an effort that alice has got it mrs oak sometimes has the fancy of having some of these old things down i suppose she takes ideas from them a sudden light dawned in my mind the white dress in which i had seen mrs oak in the yellow room the day that she showed me lovelock's verses was not as i had thought a modern copy it was the original dress of alice oak the daughter of virgil pomfret the dress in which perhaps christopher lovelock had seen her in that very room
the idea gave me a delightful picturesque shudder i said nothing but i pictured to myself mrs oak sitting in that yellow room that room which no oak of oakhurst save herself ventured to remain in alone in the dress of her ancestress confronting as it were that vague haunting something that seemed to fill the place that vague presence it seemed to me of the murdered cavalier poet mrs oak as i have said was extremely silent as a result of being extremely indifferent she really did not care in the least about anything except her own ideas and daydreams except when every now and then she was seized with a sudden desire to shock the prejudices or superstitions of her husband very soon she got into the way of never talking to me at all save about alice and nicholas oak and christopher lovelock and then when the fit seized her she would go on by the hour never asking herself whether i were or were not equally interested in the strange craze that fascinated her it so happened that i was i loved to listen to her going on discussing by the hour the merits of lovelock's poems and analyzing her feelings and those of her two ancestors it was quite wonderful to watch the exquisite exotic creature in one of these moods with the distant look in her grey eyes and the absent-looking smile in her thin cheeks talking as if she had intimately known these people of the seventeenth century discussing every minute mood of theirs detailing every scene between them and their victim talking of alice and nicholas and lovelock as she might of her most intimate friends of alice particularly and of lovelock she seemed to know every word that alice had spoken every idea that had crossed her mind it sometimes struck me as if she were telling me speaking of herself in the third person of her own feelings as if i were listening to a woman's confidences the recital of her doubts scruples and agonies about a living lover for mrs oak who seemed the most self-absorbed of creatures in all other matters and utterly incapable of understanding or sympathizing with the feelings of other persons entered completely and passionately into the feelings of this woman this alice who at some moments seemed to be not another woman but herself but how could she do it how could she kill the man she cared for i once asked her because she loved him more than the whole world she exclaimed and rising suddenly from her chair walked towards the window covering her face with her hands i could see from the movement of her neck that she was sobbing she did not turn round but motioned me to go away don't let us talk any more about it she said i am ill today, and silly i closed the door gently behind me what mystery was there in this woman's life this listlessness this strange self-engrossment and stranger mania about people long dead this indifference and desire to annoy towards her husband did it all mean that alice oak had loved or still loved someone who was not the master of oakhurst and this melancholy this preoccupation the something about him that told of a broken youth did it mean that he knew it? End of chapter 4LibriVox.org The following days, Mrs. Oak was in a condition of quite unusual good spirits. Some visitors, distant relatives, were expected, and although she had expressed the utmost annoyance at the idea of their coming, she was now seized with a fit of housekeeping activity, and was perpetually about arranging things and giving orders, although all arrangements, as usual, had been made, and all orders given by her husband. William Oak was quite radiant. "'If only Alice were always well like this,' he exclaimed. "'If only she would take, or could take, an interest in life, how different things would be!' but he added as if fearful lest he should be supposed to accuse her in any way 
how can she usually with her wretched health? Still, it does make me awfully happy to see her like this. I nodded, but I cannot say that I really acquiesced in his views. It seemed to me particularly with the recollection of yesterday's extraordinary scene that Mrs. Oak's high spirits were anything but normal. There was something in her unusual activity and still more unusual cheerfulness that was merely nervous and feverish, and I had the whole day the impression of dealing with a woman who was ill and who would very speedily collapse. Mrs. Oak spent her day wandering from one room to another and from the garden to the greenhouse, seeing whether all were in order when, as a matter of fact, all was always in order at Oakhurst. She did not give me any sitting, and not a word was spoken about Alice Oak or Christopher Lovelock. Indeed, to a casual observer, it might seem as if all that craze about Lovelock had completely departed or never existed. About five o'clock, as I was strolling among the red brick, round gabled outhouses, each with its armorial oak and the old fashioned spaliered kitchen and fruit garden, I saw Mrs. Oak standing, her hands full of York and Lancaster roses, upon the steps facing the stables. A groom was curry-combing a horse, and outside the coach-house was Mr. Oak's little high-wheeled cart. "'Let us have a drive!' suddenly exclaimed Mrs. Oak on seeing me. "'Look, what a beautiful evening! And look at that dear little cart!' It is so long since I have driven, and I feel as if I must drive again. Come with me, and you, harness Jim at once and come round to the door. I was quite amazed, and still more so when the cart drove up before the door and Mrs. Oak called me to accompany her. She sent away the groom, and in a minute we were rolling along at a tremendous pace along the yellow sand road with the sere pasture lands the big oaks on either side i could scarcely believe my senses this woman in her mannish little coat and hat driving a powerful young horse with the utmost skill and chattering like a schoolgirl of sixteen could not be the delicate, morbid, exotic, hothouse creature, unable to walk or to do anything, who spent her days lying about on couches in the heavy atmosphere, redolent with strange scents and associations, of the yellow drawing-room. The movement of the light carriage, the cool draught, the very grind of the wheels upon the gravel, seemed to go to her head like wine. It is so long since I have done this sort of thing, she kept repeating, so long, so long. Oh, don't you think it delightful, going at this pace, with the idea that at any moment the horse may come down and we two be killed? And she laughed her childish laugh and turned her face, no longer pale, but flushed with the movement and the excitement towards me. The cart rolled on quicker and quicker, one gate after another swinging two behind us, as we flew up and down the little hills, across the pasture lands, through the little red brick gabled villages, where the people came out to see us pass, past the rows of willows along the streams, and the dark green, compact hop fields, with the blue and hazy tree tops of the horizon getting bluer and more hazy as the yellow light began to graze the ground. At last we got to an open space, a high-lying piece of common land such as is rare in that ruthlessly utilized country of grazing grounds and hop gardens. Among the low hills of the Weald it seemed quite preternaturally high up, giving a sense that its extent of flat heather and gorse, bound by distant firs, was really on the top of the world. The sun was setting just opposite, and its lights lay flat on the ground, staining it with the red and black of the heather, or rather turning it into the surface of a purple sea, canopied over by a bank of dark purple clouds, the jet-like sparkle of the dry ling and gorse tipping the purple like sunlit wavelets. A cold wind swept in our faces. "'What is the name of this place?' I asked. It was the only bit of impressive scenery that I had met in the neighborhood of Oakhurst. 
It is called Coates Common," answered Mrs. Oke, who had slackened the pace of the horse and let the reins hang loose about his neck. It was here that Christopher Lovelock was killed. There was a moment's pause, and then she proceeded, tickling the flies from the horse's ears with the end of her whip, and looking straight into the sunset, which now rolled a deep purple stream across the heath to our feet. Lovelock was riding home one summer evening from Appledore, when, as he got halfway across Coates Common, somewhere about here, for I have always heard them mention the pond and the old gravel pits as about the place, he saw two men riding towards him, in whom he presently recognized Nicholas Oak of Oakhurst, accompanied by a groom. Oak of Oakhurst hailed him, and Lovelock rode up to meet him. "'I am glad to have met you, Mr. Lovelock,' said Nicholas, "'because I have some important news for you.' And, so saying, he brought his horse close to the one that Lovelock was riding, and, suddenly turning round, fired off a pistol at his head. Lovelock had time to move, and the bullet, instead of striking him, went straight into the head of his horse, which fell beneath him. Lovelock, however, had fallen in such a way as to be able to extricate himself easily from his horse, and, drawing his sword, he rushed upon Oak and seized his horse by the bridle. Oak quickly jumped off and drew his sword, and in a minute Lovelock, who was much the better swordsman of the two, was having the better of him. Lovelock had completely disarmed him and got his sword upon Oak's neck, crying out to him that if he would ask forgiveness he should be spared for the sake of their old friendship, when the groom suddenly rose up from behind and shot Lovelock through the back. Lovelock fell, and Oak immediately tried to finish him with his sword, while the groom drew up and held the bridle of Oak's horse. At that moment the sunlight fell upon the groom's face, and Lovelock recognized Mrs. Oak. He cried out, Alice, Alice, it is you who have murdered me, and died. Then Nicholas Oak sprang into his saddle and rode off with his wife, leaving Lovelock dead by the side of his fallen horse. Nicholas Oak had taken the precaution of removing Lovelock's purse and throwing it into the pond, so the murder was put down to certain highwaymen who were about in that part of the country. Alice Oak died many years afterwards, quite an old woman, in the reign of Charles the Second. But Nicholas did not live very long, and shortly before his death got into a very strange condition, always brooding, and sometimes threatening to kill his wife. They say that in one of these fits, just shortly before his death, he told the whole story of the murder, and made a prophecy that when the head of his house and master of Oakhurst should marry another Alice Oak, descended from himself and his wife, there should be an end of the Oaks of Oakhurst. You see, it seems to be coming true. We have no children, and I don't suppose we shall ever have any. I, at least... I've never wished for them. Mrs. Oak paused and turned her face towards me with the absent smile in her thin cheeks. Her eyes no longer had the distant look. They were strangely eager and fixed. I did not know what to answer. This woman positively frightened me. We remained for a moment in that same place, with the sunlight dying away in crimson ripples on the heather, gilding the yellow banks, the black waters of the pond, surrounded by thin rushes and the gravel pits, while the wind blew in our faces and bent the ragged, warped, bluish tops of the firs. Then Mrs. Oak touched the horse, and we went off at a furious pace. We did not exchange a single word, I think, on the way home. Mrs. Oak sat with her eyes fixed on the reins, breaking the silence now and then only by a word to the horse, urging him to an even more furious pace. The people we met along the roads must have thought that the horse was running away, unless they noticed Mrs. Oak's calm manner and the look of excited enjoyment in her face. To me it seemed that I was in the hands of a mad woman, and I quietly prepared myself for being upset or dashed against a cart. It had turned cold, and the draft was icy in our faces when we got within sight of the red gables and high chimney stacks of Oakhurst. Mr. Oak was standing before the door. On our approach I saw a look of relieved suspense. 
of keen pleasure come into his face. He lifted his wife out of the cart in his strong arms with a kind of chivalrous tenderness. I am so glad to have you back, darling, he exclaimed. So glad. I was delighted to hear you had gone out with the cart, but as you have not driven for so long, I was beginning to be frightfully anxious, dearest. Where have you been all this time? Mrs. Oak had quickly extricated herself from her husband, who had remained holding her, as one might hold a delicate child who has been causing anxiety. The gentleness and affectation of the poor fellow had evidently not touched her. She seemed almost to recoil from it. "'I have taken him to Coates Common,' she said, with that perverse look which I had noticed before as she pulled off her driving gloves. "'It is such a splendid old place.' Mr. Oak flushed as if he had bitten upon a bad tooth, and the double gash painted itself scarlet between his eyebrows. Outside, the mists were beginning to rise, veiling the parkland dotted with big black oaks, and from which, in the watery moonlight, rose on all sides the eerie little cry of the lambs separated from their mothers. It was damp and cold, and I shivered. End of chapter 5「Six of a Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The next day Oakhurst was full of people, and Mrs. Oak, to my amazement, was doing the honors of it as if a household of commonplace, noisy young creatures, bent upon flirting and tennis, were her usual idea of felicity. The afternoon of the third day they had come for an electioneering ball, and stayed three nights. The weather changed, it turned suddenly very cold and began to pour. Every one was sent indoors, and there was a general gloom suddenly over the company. Mrs. Oak seemed to have got sick of her guests, and was listlessly lying back on a couch, paying not the slightest attention to the chattering and piano strumming in the room, when one of the guests suddenly proposed that they should play charades. He was a distant cousin of the Oaks, a sort of fashionable artistic bohemian, swelled out to intolerable conceit by the amateur actor vogue of a season. It would be lovely in this marvelous old place, he cried, just to dress up and parade about, and feel as if we belonged to the past. I have heard you have a marvelous collection of old costumes, more or less, ever since the days of Noah somewhere, Cousin Willie. The whole party exclaimed in joy at this proposal. William Oak looked puzzled for a moment, and glanced at his wife, who continued to lie listless on her sofa. "'There is a press full of clothes belonging to the family,' he answered dubiously, apparently overwhelmed by the desire to please his guests. "'But, but, I don't know whether it's quite respectful to dress up in the clothes of dead people.' "'Oh, fiddlestick!' cried the cousin. "'What do the dead people know about it? "'Besides,' he added with mock seriousness, "'I assure you we shall behave in the most reverent way "'and feel quite solemn about it all, "'if only you will give us the key, old man.' "'Again Mr. Oak looked towards his wife, "'and again met only her vague, absent glance. "'Very well,' he said, and led his guests upstairs.' An hour later the house was filled with the strangest crew and the strangest noises. I had entered to a certain extent into William Oak's feeling of unwillingness to let his ancestors' clothes and personality be taken in vain. But when the masquerade was complete, I must say that the effect was quite magnificent. A dozen youngish men and women, those who were staying in the house and some neighbors who had come for lawn tennis and dinner, were rigged out, under the direction of the theatrical cousin, in the contents of that oaken press, 
and I have never seen a more beautiful sight than the panelled corridors, the carved and escutcheoned staircase, the dim drawing-rooms with their faded tapestries, the great hall with its vaulted and ribbed ceiling, dotted about with groups or single figures that seem to have come straight from the past. Even William Oak, who, besides myself and a few elderly people, was the only man not masqueraded, seemed delighted and fired by the sight. A certain schoolboy character suddenly came out in him, and finding that there was no costume left for him, he rushed upstairs and presently returned in the uniform he had worn before his marriage. I thought I had really never seen so magnificent a specimen of the handsome Englishman. He looked, despite all the modern associations of his costume, more genuinely old-world than all the rest. A knight for the Black Prince or Sidney, with his admirably regular features and beautiful fair hair and complexion. After a minute even the elderly people had got costumes of some sort, dominoes arranged at the moment, and hoods, and all manner of disguises made out of pieces of old embroidery and oriental stuffs and furs and very soon this rabble of maskers had become, so to speak, completely drunk with its own amusement, with the childishness, and, if I may say so, the barbarism, the vulgarity underlying the majority even of well-bred English men and women, Mr. Oak himself doing the mountebank like a schoolboy at Christmas. "'Where is Mrs. Oak? Where is Alice?' someone suddenly asked. Mrs. Oak had vanished. I could fully understand that to this eccentric being, with her fantastic, imaginative, morbid passion for the past, such a carnival as this must be positively revolting. And, absolutely indifferent as she was to giving offence, I could imagine how she would have retired, disgusted and outraged, to dream her strange daydreams in the yellow room. But a moment later, as we were all noisily preparing to go in to dinner, the door opened and a strange figure entered, stranger than any of these others who were profaning the clothes of the dead. A boy, slight and tall, in a brown riding coat, leathern belt and big buff boots, a little grey cloak over one shoulder, a large grey hat slouched over the eyes, a dagger and pistol at the waist. It was Mrs. Oak, her eyes preternaturally bright, and her whole face lit up with a bold, perverse smile. Everyone exclaimed, and stood aside. Then there was a moment's silence, broken by faint applause, even to a crew of noisy boys and girls playing the fool in the garments of men and women long dead and buried, there is something questionable in the sudden appearance of a young married woman the mistress of the house in a riding coat and jack-boots and mrs oak's expression did not make the jest seem any the less questionable what is that costume asked the theatrical cousin who after a second had come to the conclusion that mrs oak was merely a woman of marvellous talent whom he must try and secure for his amateur troupe next season it is the dress in which an ancestress of ours my namesake alice oak used to go out riding with her husband in the days of charles i she answered and took her seat at the head of the table involuntarily my eyes sought out those of oak of oakhurst he who blushed as easily as a girl of sixteen was now as white as ashes and i noticed that he pressed his hand almost convulsively to his mouth don't you recognize my dress william asked mrs oak fixing her eyes upon him with a cruel smile he did not answer and there was a moment's silence which the theatrical cousin had the happy thought of breaking by jumping upon his seat and emptying off his glass with the exclamation to the health of the two alice oaks of the past and the present Mrs. Oak nodded, and with an expression I had never seen in her face before, answered in a loud and aggressive tone, To the health of the poet Mr. Christopher Lovelock, if his ghost be honouring this house with its presence. I felt suddenly as if I were in a madhouse. Across the table, in the midst of this room full of noisy wretches, tricked out in red, blue, purple, and party colour, as men and women of the sixteenth, seventeenth, and eighteenth centuries, as improvised Turks and Eskimos, and dominoes and clowns with faces painted and corked and flowered over, 
I seemed to see that sanguine sunset washing like a sea of blood over the heather, to where, by the black pond and the wind-warped firs, was lying the body of Christopher Lovelock, with his wounded horse near him, the yellow gravel and lilac lings soaked crimson all around, and above emerged, as out of the redness, the pale blonde head covered with the gray hat, the absent eyes, and strange smile of Mrs. Oak. It seemed to me horrible, vulgar, abominable, as if I had got inside a madhouse. End of chapter 6「Seven of a Phantom Lover » by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From that moment I noticed a change in William Oak, or, rather, a change that had probably been coming on for some time got to the stage of being noticeable. I don't know whether he had any words with his wife about her masquerade of that unlucky evening. On the whole, I decidedly think not. Oak was with every one a diffident and reserved man, and most of all so with his wife. Besides, I can fancy that he would experience a positive impossibility of putting into words any strong feeling of disapprobation towards her, that his disgust would necessarily be silent. But be this as it may, I perceived very soon that the relations between my host and hostess had become exceedingly strained. Mrs. Oak, indeed, had never paid much attention to her husband and seemed merely a trifle more indifferent to his presence than she had been before. But Oak himself, although he affected to address her at meals, from a desire to conceal his feeling and a fear of making the position disagreeable to me, very clearly could scarcely bear to speak to or even see his wife. The poor fellow's honest soul was quite brimful of pain, which he was determined not to permit to overflow, and which seemed to filter into his whole nature and poison it. This woman had shocked and pained him more than was possible to say, and yet it was evident that he could neither cease loving her nor commence comprehending her real nature. I sometimes felt, as we took our long walks through the monotonous country, across the oak-dotted grazing grounds, and by the brink of the dull green serried hop-rows, talking at rare intervals about the value of the crops, the drainage of the estate, the village schools, the primrose league, and the iniquities of Mr. Gladstone, while Oak of Oakhurst carefully cut down every tall thistle that caught his eye. I sometimes felt, I say, an intense and impotent desire to enlighten this man about his wife's character. I seemed to understand it so well, and to understand it well seemed to imply such a comfortable acquiescence, and it seemed so unfair that just he should be condemned to puzzle forever over this enigma, and wear out his soul trying to comprehend what now seemed so plain to me but how would it ever be possible to make the serious, conscientious, slow-brained representative of English simplicity and honesty and thoroughness understand the mixture of self-engrossed vanity, of shallowness, of poetic vision, of love and morbid excitement that walked this earth under the name of Alice Oak? So, Oak of Oakhurst was condemned never to understand, but he was condemned also to suffer from his inability to do so. The poor fellow was constantly straining after an explanation of his wife's peculiarities, and, although the effort was probably unconscious, it caused him a great deal of pain. The gash, the maniac frown, as my friends call it, between his eyebrows, seemed to have grown a permanent feature of his face. Mrs. Oak, on her side, was making the very worst of the situation. 
Perhaps she resented her husband's tacit reproval of that masquerade night's freak, and determined to make him swallow more of the same stuff, for she clearly thought that one of William's peculiarities, and one for which she despised him, was that he could never be goaded into an outspoken expression of disapprobation, that from her he would swallow any amount of bitterness without complaining. At any rate, she now adopted a perfect policy of teasing and shocking her husband about the murder of Lovelock. She was perpetually alluding to it in her conversation, discussing in his presence what had or had not been the feelings of the various actors in the tragedy of 1626, and insisting upon her resemblance to, and almost identity with, the original Alice Oak. Something had suggested to her eccentric mind that it would be delightful to perform in the garden at Oakhurst, under the huge ilexes and elms, a little mask which she had discovered among Christopher Lovelock's works, and she began to scour the country and enter into vast correspondence for the purpose of effectuating this scheme. Letters arrived every other day from the theatrical cousin, whose only objection was that Oakhurst was too remote a locality for an entertainment in which he foresaw great glory to himself. And every now and then there would arrive some young gentleman or lady whom Alice Oak had sent for to see whether they would do. I saw very plainly that the performance would never take place, and that Mrs. Oak herself had no intention that it ever should. She was one of those creatures to whom realization of a project is nothing, and who enjoy plan-making almost the more for knowing that all will stop short at the plan. Meanwhile, this perpetual talk about the pastoral, about Lovelock, this continual attitudinizing as the wife of Nicholas Oak, had the further attraction to Mrs. Oak of putting her husband into a condition of frightful, though suppressed, irritation, which she enjoyed with the enjoyment of a perverse child. You must not think that I looked on indifferent, although I admit that this was a perfect treat to an amateur student of character like myself. I really did feel most sorry for poor Oak, and frequently quite indignant with his wife. I was several times on the point of begging her to have more consideration for him, even of suggesting that this kind of behavior, particularly before a comparative stranger like me, was very poor taste but there was something elusive about Mrs. Oak which made it next to impossible to speak seriously with her, and besides I was by no means sure that any interference on my part would not merely animate her perversity. One evening a curious incident took place. We had just sat down to dinner, the Oaks, the theatrical cousin who was down for a couple of days, and three or four neighbors. It was dusk, and the yellow light of the candles mingled charmingly with the grayness of the evening. Mrs. Oak was not well, and had been remarkably quiet all day, more diaphanous, strange, and far away than ever, and her husband seemed to have felt a sudden return of tenderness, almost of compassion for this delicate, fragile creature. We had been talking of quite indifferent matters when I saw Mr. Oak suddenly turn very white and looked fixedly for a moment at the window opposite to his seat. "'Who's that fellow looking in at the window and making signs to you, Alice?' "'Damn his impudence!' he cried, and jumping up, ran to the window, opened it, and passed out into the twilight. We all looked at each other in surprise. Some of the party remarked upon the carelessness of servants in letting nasty-looking fellows hang about the kitchen. Others told stories of tramps and burglars.' Mrs. Oak did not speak, but I noticed the curious, distant-looking smile in her thin cheeks. After a minute, William Oak came in, his napkin in his hand. He shut the window behind him and silently resumed his place. "'Well, who was it?' we all asked. "'Nobody. I—I I must have made a mistake,' he answered, and turned crimson, while he busily peeled a pear." It was probably Lovelock, remarked Mrs. Oak, just as she might have said it was probably the gardener, but with that faint smile of pleasure still on her face. Except the theatrical cousin, who burst into a loud laugh, none of the company had ever heard Lovelock's name, and doubtless imagining him to be some natural appanage of the Oak family, groom or farmer, said nothing, 
so the subject dropped from that evening onwards things began to assume a different aspect that incident was the beginning of a perfect system a system of what i scarcely know how to call it a system of grim jokes on the part of mrs oak of superstitious fancies on the part of her husband a system of mysterious persecutions on the part of some less earthly tenant of oakhurst well yes after all why not we have all heard of ghosts had uncles cousins grandmothers nurses who have seen them we are all a bit afraid of them at the bottom of our soul so why shouldn't they be i am too sceptical to believe in the impossibility of anything for my part besides when a man has lived throughout a summer in the same house with a woman like mrs oak of oakhurst he gets to believe in the possibility of a great many improbable things i assure you as a mere result of believing in her and when you come to think of it why not that a weird creature visibly not of this earth a reincarnation of a woman who murdered her lover two centuries and a half ago that such a creature should have the power of attracting about her being altogether superior to earthly lovers the man who loved her in that previous existence whose love for her was his death what is there astonishing in that mrs oak herself i feel quite persuaded believed or half believed it indeed she very seriously admitted the possibility thereof one day when i made the suggestion half in jest at all events it rather pleased me to think so it fitted in so well with the woman's whole personality it explained those hours and hours spent all alone in the yellow room where the very air with its scent of heady flowers and old perfumed stuffs seemed redolent of ghosts it explained that strange smile which was not for any of us and yet was not merely for herself that strange far-off look in the wide pale eyes i liked the idea and i liked to tease or rather to delight her with it how should i know that the wretched husband would take such matters seriously he became day by day more silent and perplexed looking and as a result worked harder and probably with less effect at his land improving schemes and political canvassing it seemed to me that he was perpetually listening watching waiting for something to happen a word spoken suddenly the sharp opening of a door would make him start turn crimson and almost tremble the mention of lovelock brought a helpless look half a convulsion like that of a man overcome by great heat into his face and his wife so far from taking any interest in his altered looks went on irritating him more and more every time that the poor fellow gave one of those starts of his or turned crimson at the sudden sound of a footstep mrs oak would ask him with her contemptuous indifference whether he had seen lovelock i soon began to perceive that my host was getting perfectly ill he would sit at meals never saying a word with his eyes fixed scrutinizingly on his wife as if vainly trying to solve some dreadful mystery while his wife ethereal exquisite went on talking in her listless way about the mask about lovelock always about lovelock during our walks and rides which we continued pretty regularly he would start whenever in the roads or lanes surrounding oakhurst or in its grounds we perceived a figure in the distance i have seen him tremble at what on nearer approach i could scarcely restrain my laughter on discovering to be some well-known farmer or neighbor or servant once as we were returning home at dusk he suddenly caught my arm and pointed across the oak-dotted pastures in the direction of the garden then started off almost at a run with his dog behind him as if in pursuit of some intruder who was it i asked and mr oak merely shook his head mournfully sometimes in the early autumn twilights when the white mists rose from the park land and the rooks formed long black lines on the palings i almost fancied i saw him start at the very trees and bushes the outlines of the distant outhouses with their conical roofs and projecting veins like jibing fingers in the half-light your husband is ill i once ventured to remark to mrs oak as she sat for the hundred and thirtieth of my preparatory sketches i somehow could never get beyond preparatory sketches with her she raised her beautiful wide 
pale eyes making as she did so that exquisite curve of shoulders and neck and delicate pale head that i so vainly longed to reproduce i don't see it she answered quietly if he is why doesn't he go up to town and see the doctor it's merely one of his glum fits you should not tease him about lovelock i added very seriously he will get to believe in him why not if he sees him why he sees him he would not be the only person that has done so and she smiled faintly and half perversely as her eyes sought that usual distant indefinable something but oak got worse he was growing perfectly unstrung like a hysterical woman one evening that we were sitting alone in the smoking room he began unexpectedly a rambling discourse about his wife how he had first known her when they were children and they had gone to the same dancing school near portland place how her mother his aunt-in-law had brought her for a christmas to oakhurst while he was on his holidays how finally thirteen years ago when he was twenty-three and she was eighteen they had been married how terribly he had suffered when they had been disappointed of their baby and she had nearly died of the illness i did not mind about the child you know he said in an excited voice although there will be an end of us now and oakhurst will go to the curtises i minded only about alice it was next to inconceivable that this poor excited creature speaking almost with tears in his voice and in his eyes was the quiet well got up irreproachable young ex-guardsman who had walked into my studio a couple of months before oak was silent for a moment looking fixedly at the rug at his feet when he suddenly burst out in a scarce audible voice if you knew how i cared for alice how i still care for her i could kiss the ground she walks upon i would give anything my life any day if only she would look for two minutes as if she liked me a little as if she didn't utterly despise me and the poor fellow burst into a hysterical laugh which was almost a sob then he suddenly began to laugh outright exclaiming with a sort of vulgarity of intonation which was extremely foreign to him damn it old fellow this is a queer world we live in and rang for more brandy and soda which he was beginning i noticed to take pretty freely now although he had been almost a blue ribbon man as much so as is possible for a hospitable country gentleman when i first arrived end of chapter seven Chapter Eight of A Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It became clear to me now that, incredible as it might seem, the thing that ailed William Oak was jealousy. He was simply madly in love with his wife, and madly jealous of her. Jealous, but of whom? He himself would probably have been quite unable to say. In the first place, to clear off any possible suspicion, certainly not of me. Besides, the fact that Mrs. Oak took only just a very little more interest in me than in the butler or the upper housemaid. I think that Oak himself was the sort of man whose imagination would recoil from realizing any definite object of jealousy, even though jealousy might be killing him inch by inch. It remained a vague, permeating, continuous feeling, the feeling that he loved her, and she did not care a jack straw about him, and that everything with which she came into contact was receiving some of that notice which was refused to him every person or thing or tree or stone it was the recognition of that strange far-off look in mrs oak's eyes of that strange absent smile on mrs oak's lips eyes and lips that had no look and no smile for him gradually his nervousness his watchfulness suspiciousness tendency to start took a definite shape 
Mr. Oak was forever alluding to steps or voices he had heard, to figures he had seen sneaking round the house. The sudden bark of one of the dogs would make him jump up. He cleaned and loaded very carefully all the guns and revolvers in his study, and even some of the old fowling pieces and holster pistols in the hall. The servants and tenants thought that Oak of Oakhurst had been seized with a terror of tramps and burglars. Mrs. Oak smiled contemptuously at all these doings. "'My dear William,' she said one day, "'the persons who worry you have just as good a right to walk up and down the passages and staircase, and to hang about the house as you or I. They were there, in all probability, long before either of us was born, and are greatly amused by your preposterous notions of privacy.' Mr. Oak laughed, angrily. I suppose you will tell me it is Lovelock, your eternal Lovelock, whose steps I hear on the gravel every night. I suppose he has as good a right to be here as you or I. And he strode out of the room. Lovelock, Lovelock, why will she always go on like that about Lovelock? Mr. Oak asked me that evening, suddenly staring me in the face. I merely laughed. It's only because she has that play of his on the brain, I answered and because she thinks you superstitious and likes to tease you. I don't understand, sighed Oak. How could he? And if I had tried to make him do so, he would merely have thought I was insulting his wife, and have perhaps kicked me out of the room. So I made no attempt to explain psychological problems to him, and he asked me no more questions until once. But I must first mention a curious incident that happened. The incident was simply this. Returning one afternoon from our usual walk, Mr. Oak suddenly asked the servant whether anyone had come. The answer was in the negative, but Oak did not seem satisfied. We had hardly sat down to dinner when he turned to his wife and asked, in a strange voice which I scarcely recognized as his own, who had called that afternoon. No one answered Mrs. Oak, at least to the best of my knowledge. William Oak looked at her fixedly. No one, he repeated, in a scrutinizing tone. No one, Alice? Mrs. Oak shook her head. No one, she replied. There was a pause. Who was it, then, that was walking with you near the pond about five o'clock? asked Oak slowly. His wife lifted her eyes straight to his and answered contemptuously. No one was walking with me near the pond at five o'clock or any other hour. Mr. Oak turned purple and made a curious, hoarse noise like a man choking. I, I thought I saw you walking with a man this afternoon, Alice, he brought out with an effort, adding for the sake of appearances before me. I thought it might have been the curate come with that report for me. Mrs. Oak smiled. I can only repeat that no living creature has been near me this afternoon, she said, slowly. If you saw anyone with me, it must have been Lovelock, for there certainly was no one else. And she gave a little sigh, like a person trying to reproduce in her mind some delightful but too evanescent impression. I looked at my host. From crimson his face had turned perfectly livid, and he breathed as if someone were squeezing his windpipe. No more was said about the matter. I vaguely felt that a great danger was threatening, to Oak or to Mrs. Oak. I could not tell which, but I was aware of an imperious inner call to avert some dreadful evil, to exert myself, to explain, to interpose. I determined to speak to Oak the following day, for I trusted to him to give me a quiet hearing, and I did not trust Mrs. Oak. That woman would slip through my fingers like a snake if I attempted to grasp her elusive character. I asked Oak whether he would take a walk with me the next afternoon, and he consented to do so with a curious eagerness. We started about three o'clock. It was a stormy, chilly afternoon with great balls of white clouds rolling rapidly in the cold blue sky and occasional lurid gleams of sunlight, broad and yellow, which made the black ridge of the storm gathered on the horizon look blue-black like ink. We walked quickly across the sear and sodden grass of the park, 
and on to the high road that led over the low hills, I don't know why, in the direction of Coates Common. Both of us were silent, for both of us had something to say, and did not know how to begin. For my part, I recognized the impossibility of starting the subject. An uncalled-for interference from me would merely indispose Mr. Oak, and make him doubly dense of comprehension. So, if Oak had something to say, which he evidently had, it was better to wait for him. Oak, however, broke the silence only by pointing out to me the condition of the hops, as we passed one of his many hop gardens. It will be a poor year, he said, stopping short and looking intently before him. No hops at all. No hops this autumn. I looked at him. It was clear that he had no notion what he was saying. The dark green vines were covered with fruit, and only yesterday he himself had informed me that he had not seen such a profusion of hops for many years. I did not answer, and we walked on. A cart met us in a dip of the road, and the carter touched his hat and greeted Mr. Oak. But Oak took no heed. He did not seem to be aware of the man's presence. The clouds were collecting all round, black domes, among which coursed the round gray masses of fleecy stuff. I think we shall be caught in a tremendous storm, I said. Hadn't we better be turning? He nodded and turned sharp round. The sunlight lay in yellow patches under the oaks of the pasture lands and burnished the green hedges. The air was heavy and yet cold, and everything seemed preparing for a great storm. The rooks whirled in black clouds round the trees and the conical red caps of the oust houses which give the country the look of being studded with turreted castles. Then they descended, a black line, upon the fields with what seemed an unearthly loudness of caw. And all round there arose a shrill, quavering bleating of lambs and calling of sheep, while the wind began to catch the topmost branches of the trees. Suddenly Mr. Oak broke the silence. "'I don't know you very well,' he began, hurriedly, and without turning his face towards me. "'But I think you are honest, and you have seen a good deal of the world, much more than I. "'I want you to tell me, but truly, please, what do you think a man should do if—' "'And he stopped for some minutes. "'Imagine,' he went on quickly, that a man cares a great deal, a very great deal for his wife, and that he finds out that she, well, that, that she is deceiving him. No, don't misunderstand me. I mean that she is constantly surrounded by someone else and will not admit it, someone whom she hides away. Do you understand? Perhaps she does not know all the risk she is running, you know, but she will not draw back. She will not avow it to her husband. "'My dear Oak,' I interrupted, attempting to take the matter lightly. "'These are questions that can't be solved in the abstract, "'or by people to whom the thing has not happened, "'and it certainly has not happened to you or me.' "'Oak took no notice of my interruption. "'You see,' he went on, "'the man doesn't expect his wife to care much about him. "'It's not that. He isn't merely jealous, you know.' but he feels that she is on the brink of dishonoring herself, because I don't think a woman can really dishonor her husband. Dishonor is in our own hands, and depends only on our own acts. He ought to save her, do you see? He must, must save her in one way or another, but if she will not listen to him, what can he do? Must he seek out the other one, and try and get him out of the way? You see, it's all the fault of the other, not hers. Not hers. If only she would trust in her husband, she would be safe. But that other one won't let her. Look here, Oak, I said boldly, but feeling rather frightened. I know quite well what you're talking about. And I see you don't understand the matter in the very least. I do. I have watched you and watched Mrs. Oak these six weeks, and I see what is the matter. Will you listen to me? And taking his arm, I tried to explain to him my view of the situation. 
that his wife was merely eccentric and a little theatrical and imaginative, and that she took a pleasure in teasing him, that he, on the other hand, was letting himself get into a morbid state, that he was ill and ought to see a good doctor. I even offered to take him to town with me. I poured out volumes of psychological explanations, I dissected Mrs. Oak's character twenty times over, and tried to show him that there was absolutely nothing at the bottom of his suspicions beyond an imaginative pose and a garden play on the brain. I adduced twenty instances, mostly invented for the nonce, of ladies of my acquaintance who had suffered from similar fads. I pointed out to him that his wife ought to have an outlet for her imaginative and theatrical over-energy. I advised him to take her to London and plunge her into some set where everyone should be more or less in a similar condition. I laughed at the notion of there being any hidden individual about the house. I explained to Oak that he was suffering from delusions, and called upon so conscientious and religious a man to take every step to rid himself of them, adding innumerable examples of people who had cured themselves of seeing visions and of brooding over morbid fancies. I struggled and wrestled like Jacob with the angel, and I really hoped I had made some impression. At first, indeed, I felt that not one of my words went into the man's brain, that, though silent, he was not listening. It seemed almost hopeless to present my views in such a light that he could grasp them. I felt as if I were expounding and arguing at a rock. But when I got on to the tack of his duty towards his wife and himself, and appealed to his moral and religious notions, I felt that I was making an impression. I dare say you are right, he said, taking my hand, as we came in sight of the red gables of Oakhurst, and speaking in a weak, tired, humble voice. I don't understand you quite, but I am sure what you say is true. I dare say it is all that I am seedy. I feel sometimes as if I were mad, and just fit to be locked up. But don't think I don't struggle against it. I do, I do continually, only sometimes it seems too strong for me. I pray God, night and morning, to give me the strength to overcome my suspicions, or to remove these dreadful thoughts from me. God knows I know what a wretched creature I am, and how unfit to take care of that poor girl. And Oak again pressed my hand. As we entered the garden, he turned to me once more. I am very, very grateful to you, he said, and, indeed, I will do my best to try and be stronger. If only, he added with a sigh, if only Alice would give me a moment's breathing time and not go on, day after day, mocking me with her love luck. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of a Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I had begun Mrs. Oak's portrait, and she was giving me a sitting. She was unusually quiet that morning, but it seemed to me with the quietness of a woman who is expecting something, and she gave me the impression of being extremely happy. She had been reading, at my suggestion, the Vita Nuova, which she did not know before, and the conversation came to turn upon that, and upon the question whether love so abstract and so enduring were a possibility. Such a discussion, which might have savored of flirtation in the case of almost any other young and beautiful woman, became in the case of Mrs. Oak something quite different. It seemed distant, intangible, not of this earth, like her smile and the look in her eyes. Such love as that, she said, looking into the far distance of the oak-dotted parkland, is very rare but it can exist. It becomes a person's whole existence 
his whole soul and it can survive the death not merely of the beloved but of the lover it is unextinguishable and goes on in the spiritual world until it meet a reincarnation of the beloved and when this happens it jets out and draws to it all that may remain of the lover's soul and takes shape and surrounds the beloved one once more mrs oak was speaking slowly almost to herself and i had never i think seen her look so strange and so beautiful the stiff white dress bringing out but the more the exotic exquisiteness and incorporealness of her person i did not know what to answer so i said half in jest i fear you have been reading too much buddhist literature mrs oak there is something dreadfully esoteric in all you say she smiled contemptuously i know people can't understand such matters she replied and was silent for some time but through her quietness and silence i felt as it were the throb of a strange excitement in this woman almost as if i had been holding her pulse still i was in hopes that things might be beginning to go better in consequence of my interference mrs oak had scarcely once alluded to lovelock in the last two or three days and oak had been much more cheerful and natural since our conversation he no longer seemed so worried and once or twice i had caught in him a look of great gentleness and loving kindness almost of pity as towards some young and very frail thing as he sat opposite his wife but the end had come after that sitting mrs oak had complained of fatigue and retired to her room and oak had driven off on some business to the nearest town i felt all alone in the big house and after having worked a little at a sketch i was making in the park i amused myself rambling about the house it was a warm enervating autumn afternoon the kind of weather that brings the perfume out of everything the damp ground and fallen leaves the flowers in the jars the old woodwork and stuffs that seems to bring on to the surface of one's consciousness all manner of vague recollections and expectations a something half pleasurable half painful that makes it impossible to do or to think i was the prey of this particular not at all unpleasurable restlessness i wandered up and down the corridors stopping to look at the pictures which i knew already in every detail to follow the pattern of the carving and old stuffs to stare at the autumn flowers arranged in magnificent masses of color in the big china bowls and jars i took up one book after another and threw it aside then i sat down to the piano and began to play irrelevant fragments i felt quite alone although i had heard the grind of the wheels on the gravel which meant that my host had returned i was lazily turning over a book of verses i remember it perfectly well it was morris's love is enough in a corner of the drawing-room when the door suddenly opened and william oak showed himself he did not enter but beckoned to me to come out to him there was something in his face that made me start up and follow him at once he was extremely quiet even stiff not a muscle of his face moving but very pale i have something to show you he said leading me through the vaulted hall hung round with ancestral pictures into the gravelled space that looked like a filled-up moat where stood the big blasted oak with its twisted pointing branches i followed him on to the lawn or rather the piece of parkland that ran up to the house we walked quickly he in front without exchanging a word suddenly he stopped just where there jutted out the bow window of the yellow drawing-room and i felt oak's hand tight upon my arm i have brought you here to see something he whispered hoarsely and he led me to the window i looked in the room compared with outdoors was rather dark but against the yellow wall 
I saw Mrs. Oak sitting alone on a couch in her white dress, her head slightly thrown back, a large red rose in her hand. "'Do you believe now?' whispered Oak's voice hot at my ear. "'Do you believe now? Was it all my fancy? "'But I will have him this time. "'I have locked the door inside, and by heaven he shan't escape.' The words were not out of Oak's mouth. I felt myself struggling with him silently outside that window, but he broke loose, pulled open the window, and leaped into the room, and I after him. As I crossed the threshold, something flashed in my eyes. There was a loud report, a sharp cry, and the thud of a body on the ground. Oak was standing in the middle of the room, with a faint smoke about him, and at his feet, sunk down from the sofa with her blonde head resting on its seat, lay Mrs. Oak, a pool of red forming in her white dress. Her mouth was convulsed, as if in that automatic shriek, but her wide-open, white eyes seemed to smile vaguely and distantly. I know nothing of time. It all seemed to be one second, but a second that lasted hours. Oak stared, then turned round and laughed. "'The damned rascal has given me the slip again,' he cried, and, quickly unlocking the door, rushed out of the house with dreadful cries. That is the end of the story. Oak tried to shoot himself that evening, but merely fractured his jaw, and died a few days later, raving. There were all sorts of legal inquiries, through which I went as through a dream, and whence it resulted that Mr. Oak had killed his wife in a fit of momentary madness. That was the end of Alice Oak. By the way, her maid brought me a locket which was found round her neck all stained with blood. It contained some very dark auburn hair, not at all the color of William Oak's. I am quite sure it was Lovelock's. End of chapter 9 End of A Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee